Okay, well, we're in Genesis 21, 11. So, anybody go ahead and we'll just get started. Yep. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. Okay, that's, that's uh, going back, remember, uh, that they were told in the previous verse to cast out the bondwoman and her son, meaning Ishmael. And so that's where we're at, starting with that, that it's displeasing in Abraham's sight that he wants to, that he's told to get rid of the, uh, the lady and her son. But, go ahead. But God said to Abraham, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave women. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For though Isaac, through Isaac, shall your offspring be named. Okay, there you go. This is... This is the infallible word of God that's showing that the uh, seed of promise is through Isaac, not through Ishmael. The Quran, you know, the Quran never says Ishmael specifically anyway. Like I said, when they took Isaac and bound him on, which we're going to get to in another chapter, um, they, the Muslims, claim that it was Ishmael that was bound in, on the altar of sacrifice. The Quran never even says that. They just insert his name there. But never mind the fact that this was written thousands of years before the Quran, and it, it, uh, clearly indicates that through Isaac, the seed will be reckoned. And the blessing is obvious. Throughout history, the Jewish people have been the ones that have done the extra extraordinary things in human history. They've uh, blessed the world in a great way. Not just the coming blessing of Jesus, meaning the seed of Abraham, but, you know, all of them. And you look at what the, uh, who also is the seed, but, but of the natural way, which is Ishmael, They've done pretty much nothing for the world, you know, except destroy it and cause a lot of grief. And uh, you look at the Hagia Sophia, where they uh, have their mosque right now. Well, that was built by Christians. It wasn't built by Muslims, you know. So, and I'm not saying that they don't have nice things in Islam, but there's very little of them. I mean, compared to the rest of the world, they've produced very little. They've done very little. But there you go. In Isaac shall your seed be reckoned. Okay. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered into the wilderness of the sheep. Okay, so he gave her a little bit of bread and water and said, off you go. Gave her a little kick on the way. Yeah, man. And, uh, but he did promise, God promised him that he would build up Ishmael and, and um, uh, make a nation out of him as well. So he doesn't have to worry that they're going to perish in the desert. And I'm sure he told her this. God has made this promise to you. God is not going to lie, you know. But in two verses later, we get a little failing on the belief of that promise. Go ahead. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, Let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. Okay, now he's 14, 15 years old at this time. Remember, he was circumcised at 13, and uh, this is at the time that the promise was made. A year later, they have the child. So he's 14, at least 14, maybe 15 or more at this time. Uh, it, well, actually, Isaac was weaned, so 15. You know, somewhere he's, it, it makes it sound like he's just this little boy here, but he's not. He's, he's old enough to, uh, you know. But she, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I'll say is that whenever you, when I think of a, a strong mother, I, it, it, oh, it never ceases to amaze me like my wife, you know, for example. She's 90 pounds, and she's got more energy and more go she could carry her two children right now that are third, uh, 23 and 22, <laughs> literally. I mean, she's just, she's, and so I can actually see this happening, despite the fact that she's older and the child is 14, 15 years old or whatever. Um, I, uh, uh, I can see her having more strength than a child that age, just because, you know, I, 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 I stand in amazement at the strength of women when it's necessary. But as I said, this is two verses after the promise was made that he would be a, uh, uh, built into a nation, and already they've, uh, you know, they've been wandering around for how long, and she already thinks the boy is going to die. So it does show a failing in the promise of God. But here we go. Go on from there. 
as God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God, God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand. Where I will make him into a great nation. Okay, he's promising it a second time. And, you know, now obviously the angel of the Lord is speaking to her, so she knows that this is going to be true now. But it's a repeat of what was just said a couple verses before. Go on. Oh, yes, please. Okay, then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skiff with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. Okay, now this is exactly the same thing, remember, that happened when she was uh, young. I mean, when Hagar was young and Ishmael was young, remember, uh, uh, what's her name, uh, Sarah kicked her out mistreated her and she ran away from her. Actually, she didn't kick her out. She was mistreated her. She grabbed her child and ran away. So this is the second time that she has been given, you know, uh, assistance from the Lord. A well has shown up at the same place at the same time. So, I mean, you know, the Lord's tending to their needs as well for his sovereign purposes. He is going to preserve this child and make him into a nation. Okay, please. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Okay, remember she's Egyptian, so she just went back to her native land and, you know, whatever. Just probably the easiest path of least resistance is to go home and find a wife for him there. I'm going to pass it on to somebody. Okay. Next for now, so. <laughs> All right, please, anybody. Now it came about at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, okay. the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now remember, Abimelech is the one that uh, took Sarah to be his wife, and uh, he never touched her. And you know, anyway, it's the same guy, and he is noticing that Abraham is prospering there. And we're going to see this happen again with Jacob up in Pet and Moram. And uh, anyway, we're going to see this happen again where God prospers these people, and he understands that, and he knows that the Lord is with him. So here we're going to find out what the uh, result of that is. Please. Now therefore, swear to me, hereby God, that you will not deal falsely with me, or with my offspring, or with my posterity, but according to the kindness that I have shown to you, you shall show to me, and to the land in which you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I swear it. But Abraham complained to Abimelech because of the well of water, which the servants of Abimelech had seized. And Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. Neither did you tell me, neither did you tell me, nor did I hear it of, hear of it until today. Okay, so here we have Abraham is being asked to promise that he will not harm Abimelech or his people, his seed, or anybody else in any way. And then Abraham brings up a matter of a well that he had dug that somebody took away from him. You can infer it's by force here. And Abimelech says, I had no idea about this. Okay, This is the first time I've heard about it. But it shows that Abraham, and you'll see this elsewhere. Um, anyway, we're going to see it again. I'm not exactly sure where in a, a couple chapters where you know, somebody digs a well, people come and take it away from him. Digs another well, people take it away from him. And they're very... You know, it's kind of the way it is today. The Jewish people do something, somebody takes it away from them, and instead of retaliating, they just hold up their hands and they say, all right, you take this, and they just, they're very gracious about the way that they are mistreated, the way they turn around and don't mistreat their neighbors. And that's the way America is. I mean, when we have something happen to us, we do take out our vengeance on them, but in the end, we end up returning the land that we gained, like Germany, they could all be speaking English and, you know, doing American uh, studies in school right now. We didn't. We gave them back their culture, and we did it with Japan. So, this is kind of the same attitude that you're seeing with Abraham, as he, he just kind of stepped away from it. But now that he's being asked to make a promise, he's bringing up this issue about this well. So, please, go ahead. And Abimelech said, is it, are we on? 27. 27. And Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. Then Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What do these seven ewe lambs mean? What have you set? What have, which 
have said by themselves. And he said, You shall take these seven new lands from my hand in order that it may be a witness to me that I dug this well. Therefore, he called that place Beersheba, because there the two of them took an oath. Okay, so here's a play on words, and the name of Beersheba indicates that. Sheba is the number seven in Hebrew, but it also means oath. Okay, and so he's saying, I dug this oath, and I am presenting these seven lambs here as a testament that I actually dug this, this well. And, you know, so they're making an oath, and at the same time, he's taking seven lambs to, like, it's like a play on the words. And we'll see this again. Same, same thing happens at the time of Isaac, um, as far as the name of Beersheba. But, um, what's that? Well, they cut a covenant of peace. That's his well. I dug this, and I want you to make sure that this belongs to me, and then at the same time, he's going to fulfill the, what Abimelech asked and said, listen, they're yeah, don't, yeah, they're going to agree together. Now, the one thing that I, I think about every time I read this account and when I read the account of Jacob when he comes back from Padamaram, and I, I don't know if you know the story, but Laban pursues him, and he meets up with him finally, and he says, listen, you ran away from here, took all of my family, took everything, and uh, finally they make a... Uh, an agreement and they build a little uh, tower basically out of stones and they say this is a sign that I, you won't go past this place towards me and I won't come past this place towards you. So you have these these places where they make agreements not to interfere with each other and I always think I wonder how long that is binding. You know the name of Beersheba is, is still there to this day. and. This is just me thinking these things through. I don't want to, you to get to thinking, well, this is the way it is. This is just me thinking. Is it to this day that the Jewish people should not go over that line in aggression against the people? Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, this is two, 3,000 years later, but they have made an agreement through their father Abraham, just like when Abraham, when the Levites played, paid tithes through, Melchiz through Abraham to Melchizedek. In other words, what's binding here came all the way from 2,000 years later is binding on the, the tithes given to Melchizedek. Well, is it the same thing? That he has made an agreement with uh, him, the person that they're uh, right now will say Beersheba, that they will not go over that area in aggression. Okay. And the reason why I bring that up is because you won't see the Jewish people going in aggression over any of their borders. They're just simply not going to do it. But people are perpetually coming in aggression against them. They're violating something that happened 4,000 years ago. Now they, as the Jewish people, have a right to go. And Do you see what I'm saying, though? I don't know if this is binding or not, but I wonder if it is. If, in fact, these borders, which God has set into his word, are binding on the people today. And I just wonder about that personally. You know, I've never heard anybody comment on it one way or another. When uh, God told, told him that he'd have all the land as far as he could see. Right. Um, which is, and then King David took it clear over to Iran, I guess. All the way to the Euphrates. Right, to the Euphrates. It seems like that's where the borders should be. For Israel, right. And Egypt, all the way to the Mediterranean. And, all the way and that's what the promise was. The promise, the land promise, goes from the Wadi of Egypt all the way up to the Euphrates River. Okay, so all of that is promised to them, and that actually belonged to them during the time of Solomon for a short time. Okay, and that I believe will be theirs again in the millennial kingdom. I, I, I have a feeling that's the case, all right? And I think the Bible would support that. But I just wonder about these landmarkers and the places that are named based on those landmarkers that exist to this day. Is that something that is binding on them to not violate until somebody violates it against them? And then, of course, they have every right to, to retaliate. But I just wonder that. That's all. I'm not trying to make any doctrine or to get you to think that that's the way it is, but I just that, that is something I'm always curious about when I read this and the other verses where they establish a witness, um, which is the name of the, when Laban came down, one of them called it Mizpah, I believe, and the other one called it uh, uh, Jagar Sadahutha, which is Aramaic. Anyway, so one of them named it the Aramaic name, one of them named it the Hebrew name, but it is a witness that neither one of them will violate that land promise against each other. Anyway, enough of that. It's just something that pops into my head. What's that? That's all the way in the south of Israel. Let's see. Let me, uh, all the way down here. Beersheba would be, this is Judah, it would be way down here at the very bottom of, uh, oh, right down here. Oh. Very bottom of 
Israel.